Welcome to the Simply Jenna podcast. This is Breaking the Stigma, a special mini series. Join us as we interview different people and talk about their journey to wellness. If you have thought about getting support but were afraid, or are afraid of what others might think, this series is for you. Stay tuned for some really good stories. Welcome to another episode of the Simply Jenna podcast. This is Breaking the Stigma. Yes, we're back for another exciting episode with Dr. Rob Tange, who is a practicing psychiatrist and also co-founder and chief medical officer for the Newly Institute. So in this episode, we chat about his new exciting adventure with the Newly Institute, and it's a really fantastic conversation about some maybe controversial things. Yes. It's exciting. We hope you like it. All right. So thank you so much, Rob, for joining us today. Can we kick off by maybe uh, having you tell us a little bit about yourself, maybe your hometown, your occupation, maybe a fun fact if you have one? Sure. We're so serious now. I it's know, funny. We're, right? We're like enjoying wine now. We're serious. It's like, exactly. let's keep it together. We have to um, be professional. Yeah. yeah. Professional. Okay. We'll do that. Yeah. Uh, we won't talk about anything we were talking about. No. Before. That's so right. Exactly. I, uh, I grew up in Southern Alberta. I was born in Northern Alberta, but grew up in Southern Alberta. Okay. Um, and yeah, I think pretty normal childhood. Yeah. Grew up a uh, single mom, a uh, little brother. You know, she, uh, my mom went, worked full time, went to school at night. Oh, wow. Uh, so we learned really early, do the dishes, make suppers, chores, uh, a lot of expectations and uh, responsibilities. And I think that sticks with you. you yeah, kinda, absolutely. You, you learn responsibilities, you learn dedication to what you're doing. Yeah. And uh, if you don't do something, you, you're going to have to deal with it. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, so a fun fact. Yeah, fun, fact. fun fact. Fun fact. I used to sell vacuums. What? Yeah, I know, no <laughs> shit. I, I really did. I sold vacuum cleaners. Really? Wow. Yeah, yeah. Like filter, door to filter door? Clean, door to door. Oh my god. Yeah, not not just for a little bit. I um, the 1990s, I got kicked out of college. Okay. Uh, medicine hat. Um, pretty fun time. Yeah. I, I enjoyed the entire experience of medicine hat except school. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Clearly. So I never went. You yeah. know, and uh, I didn't really have any study habits anyway. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I went to medicine out. I was 17. Um, after a year, uh, we, we just, we partied a lot. We yeah. didn't go to school yeah. and I was just a disaster. So, yeah. um, afterwards it was, um, you know, 92, 93 and around there at 1993. And, uh, the economy was not good. Okay. Yeah. I really wanted to be a bartender because <laughs> that's where the action was, yeah. people, everything. And yes. I couldn't get a job because I'd never done that before. Yeah. Uh, and I answered an ad set up in display department. So I actually thought I was setting up mannequins at Sears. And I was like, oh. Ooh, I, I could do that shit. <laughs> yeah, right? that's exciting. Throw some high tops on them. Yeah. Stuff, right? It'd be <laughs> yeah. easy. And uh, I went to this job interview and it was in this little office. It was pretty nice and younger guys there. And yeah, right. They, you know, were really nice. And uh, I left the interview and I was like, well, that was really good. And I remember going home. My mom's like, so what, what was the job about? I have no idea. <laughs> no clue. I had no, like not even remotely. And oh, I just, no. you know, it was an office. And I thought, wow, an office. Yeah. Like, wow. It's exciting. It could be cool and, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. They were wearing ties. Yeah. Right? <laughs> oh, <wow>. Fancy. <laughs> so um, I get the phone call the next day. You got the job. Awesome. Tell my mom I got the job. What is it? I don't know. <laughs> Still. Still don't know. No clue. <laughs> and she's like, all right, well, you got a job now. You don't quit that till you get the next one. Okay. Right. Yeah. And so right before that, I smashed up my mom's car. Oh. And again, single mom. Yeah. yeah. You know, didn't screw around with the car. Yeah. Uh, and so I did. And it was kind of this... Get a job, fix yeah. my car, get out. Yeah. Right. Those are your choices. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I was like, okay, I gotta get this done. Uh, so then um, I go to my first day of training. Yeah. It's in the evening. Uh, <laughs> go through this kind of flip binder, you know, and they're talking about dust mites and like oh, allergies. No. And I'm like, what? ooh, wow, I didn't know those things crawled in my carpets. <laughs> It's in my fucking pillow. What? Oh That's God. disgusting, right? And then that was it. And I'm like, wow. And we practiced flipping the book together. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah, that yeah. Was yeah. I got it. Yeah. Okay. It's, yeah. You know, pretty simple script. Yeah. Go home. My mom says, what's the job about? I still don't know. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> I have no idea 
what's going on? So I go on day two. And I'm like, wow, there's a lot of people out here anymore. Yeah. You know, what happened to all the other people? Yeah. This seems pretty interesting. Yeah. Tell me more about these these mites. <laughs> these so, mites. Uh, you know, <laughs> oh God. day two, they start talking about all the dust in the air. And yeah. I'm like, ooh, fuck, that's gross. <laughs> I'm breathing that in right now. Oh, my God. Oh my and God. Uh, they, they pull out this machine and it starts purifying the air. And I'm like, ooh, that's cool. <laughs> I go home. and So what are you doing? Ah, I think I'm... I think maybe selling air purifiers. Yeah. Okay, pretty yeah. cool though. Yeah. You should yeah. see the shit we breathe in, Mom. Yeah. We gotta get one. Yeah. And <laughs> so I'm sold, right? I'm yeah, already, you I'm were a, sold. I got yeah. no money, but <laughs> yeah. I buy it at yeah, the time. Of course. Yeah. Uh, I go in day three training. Yeah. And they pull out other parts, and I'm like, it's a fucking vacuum. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> and I'm like, you know, I'm there's two of us left. Like I started at 15, <laughs> ready for trains, two. And I'm looking at this other guy, and he's looking at me, and we're like, are we fucking selling vacuums? Yeah, right? yeah. We're selling vacuums. Yeah, full on. So I was like, all right, all right, all right. And they're like, you're going to take this home and go show your, your friends and yeah. family? And I'm yeah. like, I'm all right, all right. I got yeah. this. Yeah. So I go home. I, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, I got to show you. Yeah. <laughs> I show her this, this vacuum demonstration. She's like... You don't quit till you have another job. Oh, yeah. And I'm like, oh my God, oh. Mom, I was totally quitting. And she's like, you yeah. do not quit till yeah. you have another job. Wow. Wow. All right. So I called my best friend's mom. Yeah. And I'm like, hi, Donna. You know, I'm like, I got this this new job and I'm supposed to show off these these uh air purifiers. Yeah. <laughs> oh no. And uh she's like, Oh, come on over. So I go over, I show she she buys it. Oh my god. Good. My buddy was First pissed. Yeah. yeah. He's like, that was my fucking car fund. <laughs> I'm like, ah, well, sorry, man. Yeah. Anyways, uh, your mom's got a new vacuum. Yeah. Uh, and uh, they gave me a couple hundred bucks, and I'm nice. like, woo! Wow, yeah. that's good. So I was, I was into it, and then, uh, then uh, first day at work, they're like, okay, get in the van, we're going. I'm like, where are we going? Yeah. We mean, we're going. Yeah. And we drive to Cardston, oh, and we start knocking on doors. Oh my god. And I'm gosh. like, I'm knocking on. They didn't teach me this. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, I ended up selling a whole bunch of them. Good for you. And uh, I actually, you know, you you, you get pretty uh, bought into it and you really believe in it. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, you think it's a pretty great uh, product. I ended up owning franchises. I ended up what? corporate. Really? I uh, ended oh up expanding gosh. the company to New Zealand and Australia. Oh, my uh, God. And I ended up living in New Zealand for three years before I, uh, I actually, I quit. And uh, the goal to go back to school because I... Failed out of college. Wow. Yeah. Oh, my God. Rob. So there's something that a lot of people don't know about me, but yeah. now they do, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's right. That yeah. is. That's incredible. It'll be great. The next patient I have. Were you, you sold vacuums. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. I did. Uh, let's, let's talk about your cocaine use. Now. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That's incredible. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's quite a, quite a story. Uh, yeah. Certainly what I didn't think I would be doing, yeah. you know, 19 to, I was 20, 19 to 28, wow. wow, 29, 29. And then I went back to school. Yeah. Oh my God. You uh, went back to school at 29, 29 with like, I redid high school, redid undergrad really? year that I failed. Wow. Uh, I started at Lethbridge college and I didn't apply. Mm -hmm. I just did yeah. you know, part-time courses. Yeah. So you can just pay for the course and do yeah. it and write the exam. Uh, I did a few courses with a 4.0 and then was like, okay, I had enough confidence yeah. to apply and yeah. they're not going to say no to me at yeah. last chance college. Yeah. That was the nickname yeah. Yeah. and uh, yeah. LCC. And so I, uh, I applied for general studies and uh, I, I love school. The, the, you know, the best thing about college and university is, you know, I was um, a corporate VP of marketing uh, I was helping build franchises. Right, yeah. I, I was basically a therapist at work because, yeah. you know, a, a, a um, commissioned salesperson not doing well. Yeah. You know, something's going wrong at home right. and you got to yes. sit down with yeah. them. Yeah. I have people crying in my office all the time. No yeah. wonder I became a shrink. Yeah, um, <laughs> exactly. And like, you know, all of a sudden I'm thrust into this. All that matters is my grades. Yeah. Huh. Nothing else. Yeah. I had no kids. Yeah. I had no responsibilities. Right. I had enough money to like... I wasn't wealthy by any means, but I bought a little house in Lethbridge yeah, and right. had a little Honda. And, yeah. Uh, I really had no responsibilities except grades. So, yeah. you know, I came from this world of you work 16, 18 hour days, you're building these things right. up to here I am in college and all I have to do is sit here for 16 hours every day and study. Yeah. Right. And, yeah. you know, the grades came with it. Yeah. And 
So ended up at University of Lethbridge in neuroscience and uh, then UFC medicine. Oh, my God. Psychiatry, addiction, pain medicine, uh, 15 years later. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah. It was, wow. Uh, it was a fun time in university. I ended up having kids in university and getting married and yeah. suddenly oh I had God. more responsibilities. <laughs> yeah. It got harder. And I was like, <laughs> what's going good. on here? Yeah, I really like the, really the beginning yeah. here. I just yeah. sat at school and studied and then hit the bar and went home. You know? yeah. <laughs> it was really easy. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Oh, my yeah. goodness. No, wow. that's, that's quite the story. And good on you for, yes. for committing to that and yeah. seeing it through and yeah. – Despite everything that you would have been facing in that whole journey, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's that's quite wow. incredible. Yeah, you learned young commitment because your mom kicked your butt if you right? didn't, right? Yeah. So that's amazing. You know, that's you learned it from the beginning, and yeah. uh, trying to do the same with my kids, which is hard because they won't want for anything, right? Yeah, uh, that's right. I know. So trying to instill those same values in a in a much different life. Yeah, than totally. I had. Yeah. So yeah, absolutely. Really, really working on that, which. I don't I know. know. We'll see how it goes. I yeah, have no idea. I exactly. mean, there's no manual for parenting. No, right? I was going to say. Yeah. I subscribe to good enough parenting. Yeah. <laughs> They're alive and they love me. I'm, Survival. I'm winning here, right? Oh my Survival. Gosh. I think yeah. everybody is on that train. Yeah, yeah. well, right now. Yeah. yeah for full sure. survival. Yes. Totally. Yeah. And yeah, there is no right way. It's what works for you. Right? Correct. Right. As yeah. parents. In my opinion. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Me well, too. there's a lot of wrong ways, though. Yeah. <laughs> well, we don't find out. We won't, we won't talk about the wrong gonna, ways. Yeah, I was going to say, let's, let's talk about that on another yeah, episode. Yeah, sure. Not, not a lot of right ways, <laughs> but a lot of wrong ways. No, don't do God. that. <laughs> Nothing like creating a little bit of anxiety right now. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yep. Thanks, Rob. <laughs> Oh my gosh. So since uh, becoming a psychiatrist mm -hmm. and um, you have some exciting new projects in the works, can you tell us a little bit about um, where you're headed in the next little bit, what you've been working on? Yeah. I, I mean, in, in December, I had an opportunity to have a discussion. Look, I, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, we, we work in a, in a healthcare administration system that's so broken and doesn't care about its patients. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, it just came to a point where it was time to do things right. And that's yeah. what we're trying to do. So we, yeah. we've developed the newly Institute, uh, at the end of December, I, I went to a colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Marshall Ross, who, you know, top 40 under 40, the yeah. two of us developed the, uh, the Suboxone in Emergency Protocols. Uh, we actually started the first kind of study process of this, which, you know, the emergency SCN took over yes. and Heather Hare and her amazing work. And, yeah. uh, you know, and um, so I went back to him and was like, hey man, like we've done some good stuff. He, he just developed this new billing company. And, you know, there was there was an opportunity a few years ago, I met with some, some guys that were involved in BlackBerry before right. it was insignificant and uh, <laughs> so they had done well for themselves yeah. and they were trying to develop a new idea and we started talking about developing um these kind of mental health uh rehabilitation programs right. so yeah. you know there's there's these great addiction programs these great pain programs yeah. but there's nothing in the in the mental health space right. and so you know, I kind of talked to him about it and we started talking about, look, there's, there's kind of this psychedelic movement right now. Mm -hmm, right. Uh, what do you think of opening a psychedelic clinic? And I was like, mm -hmm. you know, there's some interesting data. It's not like cannabis. It's like not right. really driven by data. Uh, so, you know, I, I started looking into it and was like, yeah, man, like if we could use psychedelics as a way to develop, um, you know, th these mental health programs, mm -hmm. these disability and, and mm -hmm. vocational rehabilitation programs. And we use psychedelics for those individuals who aren't responding to evidence-based mm -hmm. uh, therapy, really the foundation of everything we're doing, then right. why not? And uh, there's opportunities. So he's like, all right, well, I got a buddy who's a lawyer. We met with him. Mm -hmm. He met uh, with uh, Arthur, who was uh, an investment banker who had already kind of started the process. And right. we sat down with, with him and well, sat down. I mean, it's COVID. So we called him <laughs> yes, and, yeah. uh, you know, we started, we started talking about what we want to do. And he's like, look, I got this team and this is what we're doing. And we signed yeah. in Fredericton. We're looking in Calgary and we're like, mm, interesting. And he showed us his, uh, his kind of his medical team and medical advisors. Yeah. And I was like, nope, 
Yeah. I don't know any of these people. They all look like cannabis people. I'm yeah. not interested. Uh, you know, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to leave my academic career and everything I'm right. doing. Uh, I'm going to do it right. right. And uh, he he literally paused for a second. He's like, they're all fired. Oh, you can have goodness. everything. You're in full control. We want you as the chief medical officer. Uh, you develop the advisory board. You build all of the physicians that we need. And I was like, <laughs> and you know, and you know, it was just kind of one of those things of like, okay, you know, <laughs> and, and like, uh oh, what did I just say yes yeah. to? Uh, yeah, you know, I have a full time job and a whole bunch on top of that yes, full time job. What am I going to do? Yeah. Uh, and then the next morning I woke up and was like, wow, this is amazing. Yeah, yeah. Like, this is amazing. We're going we're gonna to really do this. And, and Marshall was the chief scientific officer and we started talking lots. And then I was like, you know what? I'm, I'm just going to call you know, all the people I know across the country who are experts in their specific fields, sleep, ketamine, addiction, pain, yeah. uh, you know, trauma. Mm -hmm. uh, and I... I put out a bunch of calls and they all basically said yes. Wow. Uh, and it was like, holy cow, here we go. Yeah. And so now we, we've developed um, kind of a national set of clinics of intense outpatient uh, programs mm -hmm. dedicated to the treatment of trauma and mental health and first responders as well as addiction. Yeah. And, uh, you know, a lot of people spend a lot of money to go to these uh, really fancy inpatient programs. But you know, if we follow what the guidelines tell us, they're supposed to fail all the outpatient programs first, but there's not a lot out there. Right. So we really were trying to fill a gap yeah. that exists and we're doing it across the country. So now we're, we're opening uh, currently in Calgary, Edmonton, uh, Ottawa, and Fredericton. Wow. And, um, you know, the, the goal is Victoria, Vancouver, Toronto, Halifax on top of that. And yeah. then start looking stateside. So. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's uh it's awesome. And and the best part about it is how how much support that we felt. You know, you're really worried as a physician, yes. you're you're leaving AHS and yeah. you're going into the private world right, yeah. and yes, yeah. like am I going to get butchered yeah. by my own colleagues? Yeah. And instead, it was the exact opposite of you know, you needed to do this. It's the right thing. Yeah. You know, uh, our first responders and police officers and veterans deserve better. And I believe that a hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's what we're going to do. Yeah. Give them the best health care that they can get. Awesome. That's incredible. Good for and, you. And, and what a service that's needed, right? So that's, yeah. that's fantastic that you're going to be able to fill that gap yes. and, and offer that. I think so. Option, yeah. Right? yeah. So that's, that's amazing. Um, so Considering that trauma is going to be a focus of the work that you're that you're embarking on, how do you define trauma? You know that's that's a fascinating question. So I'm doing a lecture for Cambridge University oh, okay. uh, coming up, and yeah. and that's exactly what we're going to talk about. Yeah. yeah, is everything that we look at in mood and anxiety disorders related to trauma? So we hear all about uh, treatment-resistant depression, yes. right? Bipolar disorder, yes. borderline personality disorder. Mm -hmm. yeah. They're all trauma. Now, that's that's not necessarily true. True bipolar with true manic events right. where, you know, you're talking to God and God's talking back to right. you and you don't sleep for days. Mm -hmm. and that's a, that's a, a really severe illness that has nothing to do with what I speak about. But so many people are misdiagnosed in that area. Yes. Right. And so many people, you know, the ICD or the International Classification for Disease, which is, you know, our diagnostic and statistical manual, which we use in North America, yes. is the European model. Right. And they've already included complex PTSD. Okay. And this is about, you know, our adverse childhood traumas right. that then have an impact on our personality development and our ability to cope, leading to depression, anxiety, panic attacks, mm. insomnia, you know, relationship difficulties, uh, all these kind of pieces. And, and so, you know, in, in North America, we don't have that diagnosis yet, but it's coming. Yeah. Right. And so when, when you really ask what is, what is trauma, mm -hmm. trauma is anything that someone can't get over. Okay. So it doesn't yeah. need to be a, a horrific car accident right? or seeing your friend die yes. or almost dying yourself. Mm -hmm. It could be, you know, the bully from grade three yeah. that you just can't get over. Yeah. The invalidation from mom when you were 14 years old uh, after, you know, Uncle Tom was a dick. Yeah. Right. Uh, it, it's whatever you personify with 
that you were then invalidated about and you're unable to get over. Okay. That okay. is is a big focus for us. Now, for for the area we're working in mm-hmm. in in first responders yeah. and in in veterans, it's it's yeah. obvious obvious in many cases, yeah. right? I yeah. mean, you know, our our officers who dedicate their lives to protecting ours. Yeah. Uh, also dedicate their lives to motor vehicle collisions, yeah. uh, homicides, suicides. Yeah. They, they see absolutely some of the worst things, the, the childhood abuse cases, yeah. all of these, these traumas that become continuous, that they yeah. see over and mm-hmm. over and horrific, horrific things. Uh, and then you tack on you know, the unfortunate culture we live in today of defund and police mm-hmm. are bad mm-hmm. and... You know, imagine the horrific things these officers are going through. People who who decided, I want to go help society and are now being villainized mm-hmm. and butchered in the media. Yeah. Uh, and yet, you know, we're looking at a, a five-second clip. We have no... Now, there's some of them that are absolute, right? Like, yes, yeah. You can't kneel on someone's neck for, you know... Right. Yeah. Th- that's horrifically disgusting. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but that is not a representation of all officers. That's right, yeah. And and to be painted that way, uh, it's it's really quite horrific. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's a passion of mine. I, yeah. I believe uh, we we owe it to them to give them the best care, mm-hmm. and that's what we want to do. Yeah. Um, so we know like part of the work that you guys are doing with the Newley Institute is working with war veterans. Um, can you speak a little bit about what's unique about the trauma that's faced by war veterans? Yeah, I, I think similar to to a lot of, you know, officers and first line responders, there's a lot of trauma intermixed, yeah. but it's the moral distress, right. the taking of someone else's life. Yeah. Um the belief that you're going to do this for the betterment of something and the realization, what are we bettering? What are we, you know, what are we doing? And and some of those horrific stories of, you know, having a gun pointed at a child or a mother and realize, holy shit, what am I doing? The death, the policing, the moral distress of this doesn't fit my values. I, I came here for this reason and now I'm doing that. And I'm not allowed to question it. Right. Uh, I think that's that's a big piece, and that's true in policing. Yeah. Um, you know, that's true in first responders. Uh, it's true in a lot of areas, but I think in veterans, that's a huge piece. And then, you know, you're you're a part of this tribe, this yeah. group, and then you're done. Yeah. And then you go home, and people don't get it, yeah, right. and the people around you don't get it, and nobody understands what you went through. Mm-hmm. And then your friends start committing suicide. And then the people that were there with you, your people are all dying after your other people died there. Uh, again, uh, the, these, these people who, you know, chose to join the military to, to again, uh, fight for our freedoms and for what we believe in and to support what they believe going to other countries and fight for those people who are disadvantaged. Yeah. Uh, and they come home not well. Yeah. And they're scared and they, they're they also, you know, uh, mental health is weakness. Yeah. So yeah. they don't want to go and they don't want to talk about it mm-hmm. and they don't want to tell everyone about it and they don't want to they're trying to avoid it. And that's what trauma is, right? Avoidance. It's yes. just push it, push it, push it. And and the more you push, the more it bounces back, the more irritable, the more angry, the more dead inside, the more empty, the more flat, the more shameful, the more guilt, the, the more devastating it is on a person. And then, you know, you got idiots out there saying, don't worry, time heals everything. Time heals yeah. nothing. <laughs> no, no. Time just makes you used to how you've become and everyone else leave you. And so, you know, same thing, you know, like, like our boys in blue, um, and, and, and ladies in blue, uh, our veterans deserve the best care yeah. period. Yeah. No, I agree a hundred percent. 
Okay, so you spoke a little bit at the beginning about the Newly Institute and some of the services that you're going to be offering. Um, so one of the services is a psychedelic therapy. Mm-hmm. So can you tell us a little bit more about psychedelic therapy and why it's effective? Yes, yeah, so we had that, that cool chat earlier. Yes. You know, psychedelic therapy is like spending 10 years with Freud in, in five hours, right? <laughs> like, yeah. you know, it, 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 and if – I believe this was David Nutt's uh, – um, uh, paraphrasing I'm going to do is that if Freud would have kept going past cocaine yeah. and would have just tried mushrooms, yeah. uh, <laughs> we would have been doing this years ago. Yeah. Right. And you know, cocaine wasn't helping anyone and, and it wasn't helping Freud. Um, uh, so, you know, I, I think what, what really the psychedelics do is when we're taking someone who's not responded to all other treatments, that's how we're looking at it today. Now, Of course, the best of the best, we should probably always do first, but that's not how medicine works. So, you know, we're going to, we're going to take these people who haven't responded to anything else and we're going to introduce the psychedelic assisted therapy. And the idea is we want to break down all the barriers that they put up that are preventing them from getting the trauma therapy and, and responding to the therapy. And we're going to open up that individual to become more vulnerable. And we're going to let them see themselves for the way they are. Why am I the way I am? Why do I act the way I am? Why are things happening in my life the way they are? What happened? And it builds insight and introspection to everything that's happened to you. And then uh, it also seems to work really well on the sympathetic nervous system and bringing that down and stabilizing people so that they can start doing some of the skills work. Mm-hmm. And, and really, uh, I think the best wording for it, it's a catalyst. Right. It speeds up therapy. Uh, is, it, is it the answer in of itself? Like, you know, most of Alberta and BC have sat around a fire eating mushrooms at one time in their life, <laughs> uh, maybe having a few beers, and they weren't magically cured, you know? And, and most of Europe uh, has done some MDMA in a, in a, you know, a club, yeah. right? Yeah. And uh, there's still mental health there. Right. It's not the answer in the molecule. The molecule catalyzes the therapy. Right. And the answer is in that therapy. Okay. Interesting. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we're wondering um, from your perspective, what drew you into this work with working with frontline responders, mm-hmm. working with the police, working with war veterans? Like what brought you into that? So uh, again, I'm, I'm an addiction psychiatrist. So I did my psychiatry. I did an addiction fellowship. And then I did a cross-appointed fellowship uh, with anesthesia and pain medicine. Okay. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of similarities, a lot of struggles with coping, a lot of emotional uh, dysregulation, uh, a lot of depression, a lot of personality disorders. Uh, and, and, you know, early in my career, it's just what I chalked it all up to. And then, um, you know, I developed a spinal surgery pain program, then a deprescribing program. Uh, we opened up our rapid access addiction medicine program. And what what I would sit down with the residents and trainees and start talking about what, what is your formulation? And it all seemed the same. Yeah. And we started, okay, I gotta, I gotta start digging for trauma. Yeah. And the rates of PTSD were unbelievable. Right. And, you know, I'd been talking on and off at the OSI for years and, um, you know, their, their, uh, clinical lead had been talking to me and we had met many a times, Marnie and, uh, Caitlin was their CMD, who's a good friend of mine. And I finally just said, okay, I'll come. Yeah. Uh, and they're like, great. Like how much I'm I'll come for a couple of days a week. Uh, I'm going to get out of this and that. And, yeah, yeah. um, and then I, I started, and that was just to get more expertise in treating trauma. I had, you know, worked at a DBT clinic where we got trained on DBT prolonged exposure. And, uh, I had done some EMDR work and some mindfulness work and, but I, I had not learned, truly working in, in a, a program that treats operational stress and, and psychological injuries like trauma. And uh, I, I really, 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 really liked it. Yeah. I, yeah, it's, it's every, every time I meet someone, it's like hanging out with the boys from home and yeah. we just chat and like, there's a lot of shit going on and 
they responded well to treatment. And I was like, this is fantastic. But I always wondered, you know, when I fill out this template, it says they're going to be well in 12 to 24 months. Yes. <laughs> like, why? Yeah. Like, what? I have never read a protocol in research mm -hmm. that said you had to do therapy for 24 months before you'll be well. And that's where I started looking into IOPs, these intense outpatient programs and seeing someone every day and enhancing this. And, and the outcomes suggest that IOPs and, and that 24 month program have the same outcomes, except how is that the same for the person who's living with it and suffering with trauma? So I can suffer for 24 months before I feel good or one month. Ah, I think there's some different, but it, yeah, it, when we yeah. do research, that's not how we look at it. We look at the outcomes right. and the outcomes are the same, but the big difference is the retention. Yeah, right. So IOPs have much higher retention rates, you know, trauma therapy, uh, data suggests about 50% end up dropping out because yeah. hard, yeah, yes, yeah. whereas IOPs have much higher retention rates. Right. So, but we can't call it better because the outcomes are the same. Yeah. But when we look at retention and time, there's, there's a dramatic difference. So yeah, it, it just kind of all, you know, we, we talked about this earlier. Is there luck? Is there not luck? What is luck? You know, in, in my opinion, luck uh, is a little bit about opportunity meeting preparedness. And um, we were prepared and then we found the right opportunity. And, and now here we are. So would you say then we, and I think you touched on this at the beginning, but, um, you know, our aim with this podcast is to break the stigma around getting and receiving, um, mental health support. So would you say that there is a stigma that exists for maybe war veterans or frontline workers or those that are exposed to trauma as a part of their profession? Um, is there a stigma around for those people that are seeking and receiving mental health support? Of course, there's the same stigma. Yeah, everywhere. and why do you why do you well, think that is? I I think it's a cultural issue. It's it's a belief that the requirement for asking for help is weak, right? Right, and the best way it's you know we we hear all this work about stigmas about changing the language. No, it's not. It's about making it okay to ask for help. Right. Yes. yes. That's how you break stigma. Yeah. Make it normal when you're struggling to go ask. Yeah. So in, in my opinion, if you want to look at, you know, who are we going to promote, you know, option A, no problems, it's been perfect, never, never met any psychologist, must be amazing. <laughs> option B has been seeing psychology here and there throughout to better himself. Yeah. Well, to me, option B is way better because he can actually see what's going on. Whereas option A, she's in full denial, yes. right? So, and this isn't a gender thing, of course, yes. but... You know, I think asking for help and the ability to do so and the ability to better oneself should be an absolute for promotion. Yeah. But we end up promoting A. Yeah. And so when you have full leadership in all aspects and the culture is asking for help is weakness, right. which is no different in the corporate world, yeah. Yeah. no different in the health world, right. no different in any world, yeah. right? Weakness. When, when, we, when we start to connect mental health with weakness, that's where we bring, you know, the stigma. Right. And so, yes, it's, it's chock full of stigma, but no different than anywhere else. Yeah. Uh, and, and really the best way to break it down is it's okay to ask for help. And in fact, we want you to do it. Yes. Yeah. It should be mandatory. You should check up once a, once a year and, yeah. you know, the, the therapist should be in house and, you know, they should be badged up or, or whatever the case may be in whatever gig they're in and be a part of the whole crew. There's actually a, a detachment, a police detachment in Alberta that has a yoga studio in it. Oh, wow. And they really? have to do 30 minutes of yoga every shift. Wow. Isn't that awesome? Like just amazing. Uh, so we know there's another one looking at building a, a mindfulness studio in it. We're seeing the shifts occur. But it takes time to change a culture. Yeah. yeah, absolutely it does. And I think especially given all the stuff that's happened recently, of course, in yes. the in the media, yeah. right, and the pressure that all these people are under in their positions, yeah. it just further creates this, you know, microcosm of, you know, be afraid to don't ask for help and yeah. we can right. bustle our way through it, right? Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, it's just, it's hard because there's, we're trying to break the stigma, stigma, we're working really hard, but then there's this other rhetoric that's happening in the background 
of, yeah, you just need to muscle through it That's and, right. and yeah. get your job done, yeah. right? The fear of not getting your promotion. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. If I ask for help, I'll never get further than I am today. Yeah. I have to be strong. I have okay. to show everyone I'm competent and yeah. I'm on top of it. Yeah. Where, whereas admitting weakness has to be the stronger person. Yeah. Okay. We have to admit that. Yeah. Uh, and, and I'm sure you've met many people on your podcast yeah. saying the same thing yeah. in practice yeah. as well. Yeah. And, you know, those people who can go through that transformative aspect of therapy right. to get through the traumas that they've been through. I mean, those people are amazing. They, yeah. they become huge advocates of this area. Yeah. And there's another part of breaking stigma. Have people with experience open their voices, yeah. yes. you know, share your story. Yeah. 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 And that's something we're, we're trying to work hard with in terms yeah. of, you know, having people come on that are able to share their stories and their experiences. And it's so valuable because we all know for that one person that speaks up with their story, we know God knows how many are suffering mm -hmm. in the exact same way. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so we want to ask you a little bit about your perspectives on the public health system versus the private services across Canada. Um, you know, people kind of have this perception that the, the public health system is free and accessible. And it's great that in Canada, we, we have this opportunity. Um, is this the case? Well, it's, I think it's all true. I think there's massive health inequity. Yes. Uh, and, you know, the person living up north who has to travel, you know, 10 hours to get to their clinic mm -hmm. Uh, and then stay in a hotel and then see their doctor, stay in the hotel that night and then drive all the way back, taking three days off of their workplace uh, versus the person who works downtown and is next door to a clinic and just zips over and comes back. Massive inequities. Uh, but there's no question that the public health care system uh, is, is paramount uh, to – you know, the needs and requirements of, of uh, our most vulnerable. Right. Um, the problem with healthcare isn't about public versus private. Um, you know, I, th I think that uh, opening access to some private's not a bad idea, to some it's a terrible idea. Right, yeah. It really has to do more with the human resource. Yeah. If we don't have enough human resource in one area and we want to try to open privatization, it's a disaster. Right. If we have too much in that area, it seems like the only option. Sure. Uh, but the the real problem comes down to that that health inequity and how do we make sure that someone living in Tuktoyaktuk has the same treatment as someone in Toronto? Right. Yeah. And that is not the case right now. Yeah. But you know, I I absolutely think public health care is important. But you know, I I would I would quote a, a colleague who said, you know, public health care is the floor, not the ceiling. Right. And uh, public health care can stifle innovation. And we often have to look to uh, other countries uh, for innovation and for uh, new treatments and new protocols and new growth. And when we do get one in Canada, I mean, it's celebrated. A Canadian doctor yeah. figures this out. And it's like, whoa, the whole country's in praising. Yeah. But, you know, it, it shouldn't be that way. Right. Right. It should be a daily occurrence. Yeah. And we have some of the brightest minds in the world here, uh, often stifled by an administration program in the public system. Right. Yeah. You're going to get me in trouble. So. No. <laughs> <laughs> we'll stop that part of the conversation. Yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> Just on the, stop. Yeah. On the edge of the controversial yeah, con yeah. Con yeah. conversation. <laughs> um, so I guess on that note, <laughs> one more question for you then is – what advice would you give to people who are struggling then and who, uh, you know, kind of knowing the state of the public health system and, you know, being cognizant of maybe wait times and all of those things and maybe the cost of accessing private services? What advice do you give to those folks that are kind of caught in between? The you know, when we talk about public health care, here's the biggest problem. Mm -hmm. uh, mental health is basically not covered. Right. Right. So... You know, kind of like dentistry. It's just yeah, completely yeah. Ign And why, like, why are my teeth not important? Yeah, yeah. Why is my mental health not important? Yeah, yeah. You know, why when I'm skiing off zone, uh, breaking the law and I break my leg, <laughs> is that fully covered? Yeah. We'll take good care of you, man. Uh, but when I'm feeling depressed and I need to speak with a psychologist, yeah. uh, that's not covered. Right. Uh, and, and I think that's one of the biggest problems. Um, you know, our, our system is designed for how long does your society live? 
So that's important. And what are the amount of infants that die? Now, don't get me wrong. Those are super important processes. But it doesn't give a shit about, are you suffering? What about chronic complex care, chronic pain, mental health, addiction? Uh, And in fact, these are the areas that we allow private care. You know, it's not okay to have a private surgical clinic, but it's just fine to have a private addiction clinic. Right. Yeah. Why? That's stigma mm-hmm. right there, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that's the stigma in mental health. Yeah. That's the stigma in addiction, yeah. uh, you know, and, and similar in chronic pain. Like, you know, the only thing covered in chronic pain is the prescription for the medication, often an opioid, right. but not the mental health part of it, not the physiotherapy part of it, not the massage therapy part of it, not all the other treatments that often have better evidence than the medication. Right. You know, and that's really the biggest problems that we have. You know, we got into this massive opioid crisis because the only thing we covered was the prescription for the opioid. Uh, Now that the problem is about illicit fentanyls today, uh, but we got here because of our prescribing in the first place. And that was because we simply didn't cover any other area of pain medicine. And so the biggest problem is we don't measure suffering. We don't measure quality of life. And we do like we have dailies and qualies and, you know, WHO does all of this, but nobody really cares about that. Right. You know, you don't hear about that in the news. Oh, Canada's dailies are in a lot of trouble right now. Like that, that doesn't come out. Ladies and gentlemen, children of all ages, Canada is fifth on the daily, you know, like it just doesn't come out. You know, it's about, you know, Canadians are living longer. You know, and great. So Canadians are suffering longer. So, you know, that's the big thing is we we don't focus, you know, if you were to have a stroke in Calgary, man, the care you'll get. Have a heart attack. Whoa, you're going to have the best of the best. (laughs) But if you have pain after that heart attack, well, you know, maybe your GP can help you. I don't know. And the GP is like, what? What are you doing? We'll get you into a specialist somewhere. Well, you know, it's about a two-year wait to get in there. So that's that's the problem. We got to change how we measure health. It should be health and wellness, not health and you're still alive. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good point. So, uh, like last words of the wise, um, you know, for those who are suffering, how do they advocate for themselves in the system that we have? Do you recommend that? How do we, how do people get the support that they need? Oh man, that's a hard question. I don't know. I, I honestly don't. I mean, there, there's more and more organizations. There's, uh, you know, Help Alberta's Pain and Alberta Talks Pain. We've, we've really bolstered Help Alberta's Pain. And I mean, Tracy Fossum and the crazy work she does there, she's amazing. Uh, we've started Alberta Talks Pain, more in that lobbyist area and, and really how to make change. Uh, there's not as many of those in mental health, though. There's not big yeah. mental health advocacy. There's huge, you know, addiction advocacies and, right, yes. you know, plain straight up activists right. uh, where it gets kind of confusing. Are you are you advocating for people to use drugs or for right. people to get well from addiction? Right. I mean, I don't know what's going on here, but, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, we, we don't see it in, in mental health, which yeah. just continues to talk about how stigmatized this area really is. Yeah. Um I'd love to see, you know, some sort of advocacy group come together. Um, You know, we, we can, we can advocate all we want uh, to governments and so forth. But you know, the, the reality is, is our healthcare system is one of the most expensive parts of a government's budget. And a government's going to look at it and say, well, we can't spend anymore. So how do we shift it? I don't, I, no, I don't have an easy answer for it. Um, other than, you know, nobody wants to hear raise taxes. Uh, and nobody wants to hear, you know, we need a health tax. Uh, and nobody wants to hear, but everybody wants to hear, you know, we need more ICU beds. And why didn't we figure this out? Well, that's really expensive, dude. Like, you know, sure, we could do that. But then we're more taxes and we're going to take more money away from you. And you don't want that either. Yeah. So it, it's a, it's a bit of a catch 22 and you know, what we really need, we got to be really prepared uh, in, in modern history. Every time there's a recession, disability rates tank, right? Because right. Right? Yeah. everybody's hanging on to their job with their skin of their teeth. Yeah. Cause if they give any reason to be let go, they'll be fired right. and then they don't have a job. Right. So everybody hangs on and then the economy picks back up. And then everybody who's not doing well is like, wow, I'm out and disability rates go up. Right. COVID is the first time 
that we see disability rates going up as the economy has been coming down. So when the economy comes back, the disability rates are going yeah, to, to quote a, a, an excellent uh, corporate executive at one of the, the disability programs, we're going to see a tsunami yeah. of mental health concerns. Right. And most provinces and jurisdictions are not ready. Right. Many don't even believe in it. Yeah. Oh, it's corporate mumbo jumbo right. to try right. to get us to spend money and all that crap. Yeah. But it absolutely, we know it, you know. Yeah. We, we know our hospitals, this hallway medicine is occurring right now, but it's been occurring for years. Yeah. And our healthcare system is always at the cusp of collapse. Right. And so when one little thing adds to that collapse, we're in a disastrous right. position. And unfortunately, human beings as a whole aren't very good at being proactive. Right. So yeah. neither are we as governments, yeah. Yeah. neither are our leaders. Yeah. And neither are administrators, yeah. which is really what leads healthcare as administrators. Yeah. So yeah. don't expect to see much change. I don't know how to advocate, <laughs> you know, the proverbial write your MP, yeah. you know, yeah. write your MLA, yeah. Yeah. you know, don't vote for him next time. <laughs> and then do the same thing again next time. Don't vote for that one either. Cause no one seems to fix it. So it, it doesn't seem to matter if you're orange or blue or purple or green or you know, I'm a big rhino fan. It doesn't really make a difference. Yeah. None, of, none of them have figured it out. Yeah. So, uh, you know, this is where, you know, we've got to really sit down and start talking about what, what really is the best way to care for our most vulnerable, yeah. you know, and it's, we've got to stop thinking writing a prescription is the answer. Right. More skills, less pills. Yes. But we, we live in a society where we'll cover drugs and we won't cover therapy. Right. It's crazy. It is. It's crazy. And it's unfortunate that we are in such a setting people up for failure mentality. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and it's awful that that's where we're stuck in. Yeah. And yeah, it's, it's so hard to know what the answer is. And yeah. I feel like we can all sit back and look and say, you know, we should be doing this. We should be doing that. Um, but the reality is, is that it's so much more complex. Like you said, Rob, yeah. is that there's so many moving parts, right? Absolutely. I'm, who wouldn't want to say we should just cover all mental health, exactly. yeah. but imagine what that budget looks no, like yeah, exactly. and where do we take away from, yeah, that's right? right? And, yeah. and how do we balance any sort of budget? I mean, nobody seems to care about balancing budget for the last little while, but <laughs> exactly. yeah, we, we still got to be somewhat fiscally yeah, responsible. Yeah. Yeah. So it's really tough. I'm a huge advocate that we should do it, but we've got to sit down and figure out how to do it right yeah. and to maintain sustainability. Yeah. And that's where we really got to rely on our third parties. Yeah. And, you know, how is it that, you know, that we, we were meeting with a police uh, precinct in Alberta yeah. today yeah. who told us their officers get $300 a year for mental health. Yeah. And it's like, well, yeah. that's why we have a problem. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, you know, change your benefits, mm -hmm. uh, improve access through third party uh, and, and, you know, like, I don't think this is intentional. I don't think a city or a police precinct is like, they don't need more and screw them. Uh, it's more of, well, it's just the way it's always been. Yeah. And so we, we need to start looking internally. We need to fix some of these third party payers and, you know, we, we, and this is all, you know, private medicine. Yeah. And so we've got to figure out how we as a public system can work with a private system. Yeah. And, or, uh, you know, we need to crank up our GST yeah. and we can call it the G and HST, the, yeah. the goods and services and health tax. Yeah. So yeah. G S H T, I guess. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. A lot of people aren't going to like that. I mean, I'm sorry, everyone at home. I don't know. I'm just making shit up right now. I mean, there's no answer here. Don't, don't yell at me. And, and I think like the, the take home message, um, is that, you know, the reality is with COVID is that, like you said, there is a tsunami coming, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, as uh, even with talks of Alberta reopening fairly quick and people feeling anxious about that. And I think the take home message really is, is, you know, start your process sooner than what you think you should. Yes. And, you know, try to get access to services as soon as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. Um, because yeah, things are going to ramp up. It's, it's, we've gone through something that, Nobody that's living today has really experienced, Correct. right? Yeah. So, Absolutely. you know, we're all navigating this together and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's so difficult and everybody is struggling. So please try and access sooner rather than later. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah. I, I, 
I mean, uh, you, you want to really advocate, advocate to your workplace, get me better coverage, yeah. Yeah. you know, and, and get your unions together and, you know, get, get everyone together to support. And, and this isn't about, I want higher wages or I want more money or I, I want to be taken care of when I can't take care of myself. Exactly. You know, I deserve better. Uh, and just like we're advocating for better, you have to do the same. And that's, that's about the best that you can do. Or you can write your MLA. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think it'll help, but you can do it. Wise words. From what Dr. a way Rob. to end. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there it, goes. it ain't gonna matter. Take a nihilistic approach. Fuck it. <laughs> oh my goodness. Such On that a note, note, way to end. Yeah. 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 <laughs> there goes the professional. Yeah, right exactly. Out the That's okay. We're all human beings. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Rob, so much. Of course, thank it's you. it's been a pleasure. Yes. Uh, happy to come back. Happy to. Uh, yes. I won't say anything more. Yeah. I just love to come back. It's uh, awesome. And we're happy to have you. And we are so excited for the newly and, yes. and hopefully to get a glimpse of it and, and to see what it's all about. And yeah, we're so excited for you. Totally. We'll have you yeah. open. Uh, we'll have some open houses coming yeah. uh, when, you know, COVID lets us. Right. Uh, love to have you come over. Yeah. Check it out. Walk you yes. through it. We would love uh, it. And uh, really excited to show you what we're doing. Excellent. Sounds great. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. As always, we would like to end this episode with a quote. This comes from Martin Luther King Jr. Our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter.